What's the impact of the recent historic election result in Northern Ireland? Is the unification of Ireland now moving closer? And is a post-Brexit trade agreement about to be torn up? Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Caleb, sitting in for Anand Naidu, and this is The Heat. Welcome, everyone. Elections for Northern Ireland's Assembly earlier this month resulted in a historic outcome. For the first time in the history of the state, a nationalist party that seeks the unification of Northern Ireland with the Republic of Ireland came out on top. Sinn Féin won more seats than its main rival, the Democratic Unionist Party. The DUP wants to keep Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. Sinn Féin's victory allows for its deputy leader, Michelle O'Neill, to become the first minister. But so far, unionists will not agree to a power-sharing agreement with their longtime political rivals. The elections also brought renewed focus to the possibility of a border poll that could open the door to unification of Ireland, although that may still be years away. The conversation is now underway. Meanwhile, post-Brexit politics are also causing disruption. Unionists are refusing to take part in the devolved government in Belfast until issues surrounding a controversial trade agreement called the Northern Ireland Protocol are addressed. And before I get to our main panel, I want to spend a few minutes with writer and activist Eamon McCann, who has lived through the turmoil that Northern Ireland has endured over the last several decades. You have really seen it all, Eamon. Uh, someone who was on the streets in the 60s and 70s, the decades of violence known as the Troubles, uh, to where we are today. I want you to kind of, for an international audience, how important are these recent elections uh, now that nationalists, for the first time, uh, have a majority? Well, the recent elections are very significant, and of course they have for the first time produced a nationalist, uh, a majority of representatives in Northern Ireland. Uh, and that has, if you like, recalibrated the problem, the Irish problem. It hasn't ended it. It hasn't ended it. And indeed, I don't know how these things are, uh, are going to work out, what the ultimate situation will be. And what's more, neither, I believe, does anybody else. So it's all to play for still. And the unionists are certainly digging in their heels and making it difficult for any kind of transfer of power right now. How do you see this working out? And kind of give us, for an international audience, a thumbnail sketch of the differences, as broad as they are, uh, between the unionists and the nationalists right now. And how does the Alliance Party fit into all this, sort of the middle ground of these? As well, the Alliance Party does hold the middle ground. It's also worth saying, you know, that the Alliance Party is a middle class in that it is a party of you know, so the more uh, people who would consider themselves the more enlightened members of, uh, of society, the better educated and slightly better off uh, people. And increasingly, of course, they have no time for the troubles at all, and they regard them as not just a distraction, uh, a, but as something destroying the possibilities of a prosperous uh, a future. But it's also the case, while well, that is growing, and it's growing particularly among young people, uh, it's also uh, the case that people are more segregated than ever, and particularly at working class level. Uh, you have to remember that the Good Friday Agreement, signed in 1998, uh, which is welcomed around the world, sort of did, did was a, a, a help to bring a peace sort of, of a sort to uh, Northern Ireland. The Belfast Agreement operated uh, by implicitly allocating every single person in Northern Ireland into either the orange camp or the green camp, mm. either the camp of those who wanted to remain connected to Britain or the camp which wanted a, a united Ireland. And once you set up a situation like that, the dynamic leads to the more strident, robust sort of members of each community sort of uh, uh, emerging sort of as the spokespersons for that community. In other words, the group which will say, leave it to us, we will be, we will stand by our community vis-a-vis -vis the other community. And that's happening at the same time as the growth of what you call the middle ground exhibited by the Alliance. So this is quite a complicated situation uh, that we are in, sort of a number of cross currents making it difficult uh, a, a, to work out exactly in what way events are going. 
Uh, let's talk about one of the big stumbling blocks, uh, something in a, given a very bureaucratic name, the Northern Ireland Protocol. I kind of want you to put that in perspective firstly, and how does this fit in? So many people around the world are wondering, will we ever see a united Ireland? I'd like your take on that. Well, the, what seems to me certain is that if you have a poll on the border now, it would not be to set up a United Ireland immediately. Most, just many people, myself included, would like to see a United Ireland. It's interesting that in the south of Ireland, uh, in the independent part of the island, uh, while most people will say, yes, we want a United Ireland, the large majority, there always have been, when you frame the question in a different way, and you say, for example, well, would you want a United Ireland if your taxes we're going to be increased substantially? Then the answer is no, we don't want the United Ireland. We're not willing to pay that price for a United Ireland. If you say, do you want the United Ireland, despite the likelihood of this being uh, transition, being marked by violence, which is going to affect your life, then the majority of people say, no, we don't want to pay that price for a United Ireland. So it was very difficult to give a straight answer. I don't think there is a straight answer to the question of whether a majority of people in Southern Ireland want or don't want a United Ireland. In the North, of course, things are more complicated still that they, uh, uh, a, a, well, the majority of nationalists, of course, want uh, United Ireland, and nationalists are now marginally sort of uh, a, the bigger community. The fact is that the Catholics in the North and nationalists in the North have never voted for a violent route toward a united Ireland. Sinn Féin made advances uh, in the North beginning, beginning when the IRA called a ceasefire. They didn't try to make Sinn Féin, never commanded the majority support among uh, the Catholics of Northern Ireland, while the IRA mm -hmm. campaign uh, was continuing. So all these things have got to be factored in, and it will be a foolhardy person who claimed to know or even to be terribly confident about how it was all going to work out. And if I may just say a word about the, uh, a, the loyalist uh, a community, the advocates of violence to defend the North, to defend the northern state as part of the uh, United Kingdom. They are few and far between, only tiny numbers, and particularly without being patronising, sort of a, 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 the people in the lowest echelons of society, or if you like, the poorest people among the right. Protestants, they tend to have a strength, strengthened and uh, a, a obdurate our opposition to a united Ireland, their attachment to Britain uh, is great. That's a tiny number. That's a tiny number. But it is also the case that not a single elected representative of the unionist community, not one, not one, sort of supported the Northern Ireland Protocol at the, in the recent elections. And that is a factor as well which has to be taken into account. And the unionists may well feel that it hasn't been taken into account very much sort of, uh, over recent uh, years. So if you were to ask, is there a you know, a, a, are the unionists, broadly speaking, willing to accept a United Ireland, or are they moving towards it? Right. The answer, again, is we don't know. We don't know. And what is certainly the case, it seems to me, that right now, right now, uh, only a tiny number of people from the, from the unionist community wants to change the constitutional position. That is to say, the position of Northern Ireland being part uh, of the, uni of the uh, uh, United Kingdom. So all these things can change very quickly. I mean, I go back, I old enough to remember the civil rights movement right, uh, right. in uh, the 1960s, which had nothing to do with the border, nothing to do with uh, a United Ireland. And nevertheless, nevertheless, as that the E campaign uh, uh, continued and came into conflict with the forces of law and order in the North, primarily the police force, and uh, the feeling, the atmosphere, sort of the structure of politics changed to, to bring more militant uh, uh, elements to the fore. And that led on to the troubles which have lasted for so long. So it's very difficult to predict what is going to happen here. And uh, my honest answer to the question of how is it all going to work out is I don't really know. Eamon McCann, thanks so much for your time and your insight. Yeah, okay. Thanks for uh, having me, man. We have a great panel to discuss all of this. With us from Belfast is Ben Lowry. He is the editor of the Belfast Newsletter. And from Dublin, we are joined by John Doyle, professor of international conflict resolution at Dublin City University. Also joining the discussion from London is Alan Wager. He is a research associate with UK in a Changing Europe. 
thank you all very much for joining us. I certainly appreciate it. Look, an international audience, when we take something like this in, it always gets very complex, and a lot of times the subtleties get lost in all of this. The goal is to bring this out uh, in this next half hour of our discussion. And really, John, I want to talk with you, uh, looking at the recent elections, what this means. It really has been a somewhat significant uh, shakeup. People use the term historic uh, very liberally these days, but has this been a historic election? I think genuinely, I mean, it is a terribly overused word, but Northern Ireland was established 101 years ago this year, designed with a border to ensure that unionists, those who want to remain part of the United Kingdom, would remain the majority as far into the future as anyone could predict and see at that time. And yet the election uh, last, at the start of the month has shown Sinn Féin, the party associated with the IRA over many years, the most militant advocate of United Ireland, as not only the largest party in Northern Ireland, uh, but entitled to nominate the First Minister of Northern Ireland. Certainly unionists 101 years ago could never have envisaged a time when a supporter of the IRA or uh, someone who had that legacy uh, was going to be the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. So I think in this case, the word historic is justified. And as we have said, these elections saw uh, Sinn Féin become the leading party in Northern Ireland, and it means that the deputy leader, Michelle O'Neill, can become First Minister. Here is what she had to say. Today ushers in a new era, which I believe presents us all with an opportunity to reimagine relationships in this society on the basis of fairness, on the basis of equality, and on the basis of social justice. Irrespective of religious, political, or social backgrounds, my commitment is to make politics work. I want to bring Ben Lowry in. Uh, ben, uh, if you can, kind of put this in perspective for me. How historic is this? What kind of significant change uh, is this? Uh, Sinn Féin, the party that has been the political wing of the IRA, now overtaking the DUP as the biggest party. Now, can unionists accept that? Where do you think this is going to go from here? Well, I do edit a unionist newspaper, so I can try to give you a unionist perspective on it. I think it is a traumatic moment for unionists because Sinn Féin defends the IRA campaign. The IRA campaign, all unionists would say, was terrorist. Indeed, pretty much all the mainstream politicians on this island, on both sides of the border, thought it was terrorist terrorism when the IRA campaign was ongoing. And in Great Britain, in England, in Scotland and Wales, there was a universal view that it, it was a, a terrorist uh, campaign. So for a party that defends that, unionists to say in a triumphalist way, increasingly triumphalist way, to become the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland is a difficult moment for unionism. However, I do think it's easy to overstate what's happened. So Sinn Féin only got 29% of the vote. That was more than anyone else. There's a lot of parties here. It does mean that 70% approaching three quarters of people did not uh, vote for Sinn Féin. And the largest group, uh, if you bundle them all together, was for unionist parties. They didn't get a majority. They got 42% of the vote, the people who want to stay in the United Kingdom. The nationalist parties, the, the various parties, including Sinn Féin, that want Ireland to be outside of Britain and one unit, um, got 40%. And the, the big thing in this election and the, the challenge for unionism and the challenge for Sinn Féin is a very large group in the centre, approaching 20%, who are going to decide the future, who are going to decide these things, who are going to be the people who will ultimately have the say on whether or not we stay in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. as our readers hope we do, or join a, a, an independent Republic of Ireland. Well, Ben, I want to quickly follow up with you as well, because right now the unionists are digging in their heels and they are not ready uh, to restore government with uh, Sinn Féin. And one of the big stumbling blocks, obviously, is a trade issue, which we're going to talk at length about. Uh, it is in, called the Northern Ireland Protocol. Now, it was designed post-Brexit, of course, uh, an agreement between the UK and the EU to prevent a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, which is part of the EU. Now, why is this such a, 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 a lightning rod, if you will, for unionists? The reason that it's a lightning rod is it was a very complicated thing. And when the Northern Ireland Protocol was passed, because it's trade and it's law and it's all sorts of things, um, it's very few people understand these things in detail. And it's become more controversial as it's gone on. And the reason why is this. I speak to you from just outside Belfast, actually, overlooking Belfast Lock, where from on a clear day you can see Scotland. For the 101 years of Northern Ireland's existence, it was unthinkable that there would be checks on boats going back and forth. It was movements within a nation. It was like movements from Washington state by boat to Alaska state. Um, and, and, and what the protocol effectively does, to avoid a, a, a checks at the land border with the Irish Republic, the checks had been moved 
to the Irish Sea between Belfast and Scotland, between Northern Ireland and Scotland, Northern Ireland and England, Northern Ireland and Wales. And, that, and what unionists say is if as something as fundamental as trade is no longer unfettered, is no longer completely free within the United Kingdom, then that shatter is a fundamental part of being in the UK and that's why it's so controversial because with time the significance and the scale of the checks has become apparent. Okay John I want to bring you in right now a couple of things uh, that Ben talked about one saying that the unionists had the largest degree of support in Northern Ireland firstly and, and secondly uh, can I get a quick response from you on a majority of the people in Northern Ireland voted to reject Brexit and now unionists and the UK government don't want to accept a key part of that agreement. Your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's not a majority in Northern Ireland at the moment to join and create a United Ireland. It's, it's about 42-41% of parties and candidates who had a very explicit position, with about 17-18% in the middle. It doesn't mean those voters don't have a point of view, it just means the parties they voted for, like the Green Party or Alliance Party, don't have a view. Opinion polls would suggest perhaps about half of those voters do actually have a view and so the vote for and against United Ireland today would be lost, but it would be much closer than 40-60. It would be probably somewhere around 45-55. So it's very evenly balanced. And those voters, in some ways, who are least uh, invested in the whole question of United Ireland or continuing membership of the United Kingdom are the ones who, as Ben says, ultimately will decide. And they'll probably decide on issues like the economy, and membership of the European Union would be a huge issue for them. And that's, I suppose, the link with the Brexit issue. 56% um, of the population of Northern Ireland voted to remain in the European Union, but it was quite different in the different political communities. So those in favour of United Ireland, almost 90% of them voted to remain in the European Union, whereas in the Unionist community, almost two-thirds voted against. And those in the middle that Ben talked about, 70% of those wanted to remain in the European Union. So they're much closer to Irish nationalist voters in their opinions on the European Union. They're much more supportive of the protocol as a way for Northern Ireland businesses to have access to EU markets. And this is why there's such a big political divide on the protocol in Northern Ireland at the moment, because it really reflects the long-term political divides, except the middle ground has decisively moved with nationalists on this issue. Um, so you have effectively almost 60% of people who do want to prioritise access to the European Union markets even if that means checks on goods coming from Britain mm -hmm. into Northern Ireland are required to ensure that those goods can then enter the European market without any further checks on the land border. And that is the fundamental issue for unionists. They see this as a symbolic breaking up of the union, uh, the fact that there are checks internally between different parts of it, economic, veterinary and custom checks. Uh, but without those checks, the European Union's point of view is, then how do they know if goods entering Northern Ireland which perhaps only meet British regulations and don't meet future European Union regulations, but they end up in a French restaurant or a German factory where they never haven't been checked. And that's why the European Union is really quite strong that this is the most relaxed they are on any external border. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's why it's such a political issue in Northern Ireland at the moment. And Alan, I've got to thank you for being patient uh, up to this point. I want to bring you in on the discussion. Unionists say the Northern Ireland Protocol isn't working. And right now they say they don't want it. The UK seems ready to unilaterally ditch it. Here is what the British Foreign Secretary Liz, Liz Trust had to say about it earlier this week. The Belfast Good Friday Agreement is under strain. And regrettably, the Northern Ireland executive has not been fully functioning since early February. This is because the Northern Ireland Protocol does not have the support necessary in one part of the community in Northern Ireland. I would also note that all of Northern Ireland's political parties agree on the need for changes to the protocol. Uh, so, Alan, again, the complexities of this, the way it's uh, so involved, I kind of want you to broaden it for us, if you can, for an international audience. If Britain moves to ditch this as part of an international agreement that it agreed to, what is it going to do to the reputation of the country and what is your assessment of how the British government under Boris Johnson is handling the Northern Ireland Protocol situation so far? Well, I think this was all very foreseeable. Boris Johnson now claims that, this, the, that the European Union is implementing the protocols in ways that no one could have, have expected or foreseen. But this was ultimately foreseeable that the moment that the deal was signed. The UK government um, papers, the civil servants that 
analyzed the papers, said all this would happen in terms of the checks that would take place between uh, Great Britain and, and, and Northern Ireland. So the government has chosen now, uh, at the moment, that the uh, that the protocol, that the, 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 that the assembly, two thirds of members of the assembly are in favour of the protocol to start this fight about the the future of the protocol. I mean, it's, it's clear that the European Union, uh, that the, the, the UK has managed to catch the attention of the European Union and European Union member states. They're sitting up and listening to this. They're not particularly impressed. And, the, and for example, people from the US have come over, uh, Mick Mahoney's come over today and said that that shows that the UK can't be trusted to sign trade agreements. So the big question for the UK is whether or not uh, uh, this 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 style of approach, this style of negotiate, negotiation, saying they're going to introduce legislation to to effectively break mm -hmm. the protocol, is the best way to achieve the concessions and the changes that are, that they potentially want and that are potentially possible uh, in amending this in amending aspects of the protocol. And the British move is also being criticised by the uh, Republic of Ireland. Here's what the country's foreign minister had to say: This is an international treaty. It's international law. We can't just pretend it doesn't exist. Now, this was, this was a treaty that was designed and negotiated by the British government and this prime minister and the team around him, as well as the EU. John Doyle, I want to bring you back in because this is a big stumbling block, preventing right now Northern Ireland Assembly from getting back on its feet. How severely could this strain relations between Dublin, London and Brussels? Uh, I mean, they're very strained at the moment. Uh, I mean, Dublin and Brussels very close, basically on the same page. Uh, but between Brussels and London, and therefore between Dublin and London, this is probably as bad as relations have been in, in, in a long, long time. Um, there's simply no understanding in Brussels at the moment about the British position. Uh, Boris Johnson was absolutely intimately involved in negotiating this protocol. It was clear the European Union were going to require checks and goods that would then freely enter the European market. This is a position they've not offered to any other country. So it was a very favourable position to be offered to Britain. Um, and for Boris Johnson now to say that he assumed it would never get implemented, that the EU wouldn't really want to check goods, that it'd all be fine on the night. Um, it, Brussels simply doesn't understand it. Uh, they're just irritated. They, they have no understanding of what's going to happen next in London. Uh, they find it hard to respond because they just don't see the continuity from one week to the next in terms of what the British position is. Is this simply speaking to their own right wing of their political party and in the end they will negotiate a deal, as uh, some suspect, or is this a prelude to a fundamental break in relations? And if it is, I think two things will consequence. I think Brussels will slowly, but ultimately they will respond and end the trade and cooperation relationship, so effectively ending UK access to the European single market. And also with the death knell, I think, for any hope of UK-US trade relationship. Senior figures in the US Congress in both political parties have made it very clear that the UK walks away from the protocol and we end up with a no-deal situation between the European and the UK, then there's no prospect whatsoever of a US trade deal. Well, the protocol is hardly the only controversial issue going on. And ben, I want to bring you back in. What about the uh, prospect of the border poll where people in Northern Ireland would get to decide if they want to remain part of the UK uh, in favor of United Ireland. Although it's not imminent, we know that uh, Sinn Féin wants that to happen. Its leader, Mary Lou Macdonald, talked about a five-year framework. Now, do you see this happening over the next few years, understanding that you uh, do work for a unionist publication? I, I, I realize that, obviously, I, 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 I'm conveying things via a, a unionist lens. Um, I do think, even so, though, I don't anticipate a border poll in the next few years. I do think there will be a border poll. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there'll be a border poll in the next 20 years. Um, and um, one of the unfortunate things we all know about time is it goes a lot more quickly than we, we would like it to. But I don't think it will be in the next few years. The, some of the polling on this is, is confused. All of the polling shows um, a decisive majority uh, for in favour of staying in the UK. Internet polling... Uh, um, polls that are based on, on internet surveys um, show it closer than face-to-face -face surveys where pollsters go out and speak to people one-to-one. -one. Now, you could say that the internet polls are less reliable. You could say the face-to-face -face polls are less reliable. People don't want to say what they really think. But there are a number of polls that show more than 60% of people voting to stay in the UK. And unionists would say the UK is a very comfortable country to be part of, culturally. London, capital city, a lot of money that helped during COVID, um, uh, long historic ties. 
respected around the world in spite of what we're hearing about its recent actions over the protocol. So the arguments for staying in the UK are very strong, unionists would say. They probably won't be put to the test anytime soon. But there's no doubt with these changes and with the unionist majority in Stormont, the parliament here having gone, the arguments against there ever being a border poll become harder and harder to sustain. Uh, John, I want to kind of get you perhaps to step out of your comfort zone just a bit and give us what you believe the Sinn Féin feeling is on this, the historic aspects of all this. Yeah, so I mean, Sinn Féin would clearly push for preparations for a border poll. They've been absolutely clear that they do not, do not want a border poll to be held right now because the, the preparation hasn't been done for it in terms of the public discussion, uh, the Irish government setting out its position as to what that would be. I think it would be closer than 20 years, as Ben suggests. I think probably somewhere between maybe 5 and 10, 5 and 12 would be my guesstimate. I think Sinn Féin would want a good period of preparation, not least because, as Alan said, it's the middle ground that will determine this issue. Mm. Unionists make up about 42% of the population, not enough to win a border poll. So they need to persuade the middle ground. And the middle ground is not persuadable that they want to remain in Northern Ireland entirely detached from the European Union. Uh, Alan, I want to bring you in because this is obviously very difficult for London uh, as well and also considering that Scottish nationalists are pushing for Scotland to become independent and of course all of this theoretically could lead to the breakup of the UK. Yeah, I think English voters, firstly, they struggle to understand the mechanics behind the pro protocol and the politics of Northern Ireland more generally. So although, Boris, although many people in Western think Boris Johnson is picking this fight in part to have a fight with the European Union and sort of re, re, reunite that leave those leave vote that leave vote that he won in December 2019 in the UK election. In fact, a lot of British, a lot of UK, but a lot of English voters, but it's in Great Britain, mm -hmm. don't really understand what's going on with this protocol and haven't yet focused in potentially on the threat to to the union. And, you know, the, the talk of Scotland leaving the UK is still far more salient in the UK than than this question of of what's going to happen to Ireland. And uh, once again, Ben, I want to bring you in for kind of a two-part question here. One, any kind of talk about a united Ireland, is that premature at this point? And secondly, there is a hardcore extremist element on both sides of the unionist and nationalist. Now, how serious is the prospect of return to violence? Uh, could we see that begin to play out again? Well, with regard to your first question about the United Ireland, I do think what, what, what was just said there about Scotland is very significant, because as I was saying earlier, you can see Scotland from where I am on a clear day. And I think if Scotland was to leave the United Kingdom, and it was, you know, it was not that far away from voting for that in 2014, 45, 55, it would raise questions that a lot of people in Middle England don't really think about. England is by far the largest part of the UK in terms of population. 85% of the UK is in England. Um, they'd start to think about what is the UK more and do we want Northern Ireland? So what happens in Scotland is a very significant thing to what happens here. here. And I would always argue in our paper that uh, uh, unionists need to be concerned about that. With regard to the violence, I think there is a feeling within um, loyalism, the um, harder sections of unionism uh, that, who want to, to be in the UK, that violence has worked very well for the IRA um, and that uh, terrorism worked for them and that whenever Nationalist Ireland wants concessions, it gets them from the UK government working in tandem with um, the Irish government and the European Union and indeed the loyalist critique of the Northern Ireland Protocol, the Irish sea border, the, the checks that there now are in the UK. The loyalist, loyalist critique would be that this is another example of when it comes to the crunch, when Republicans, Irish Republicans are upset about something, they do a deal in their favour. So while I don't think violence is imminent, and while I think support for violence is small, um, very small, um, there are always people on both sides who who are inclined towards violence, and that's, that's obviously a worrying prospect. I want to thank Ben Lowry, John Doyle, and Alan Wager for their time and their insight. And that's it for another edition of The Heat. Thanks for watching, everyone.